Hi, this is Robin, and this is an excerpt from a talk called How to Talk About Type. The focus here is on type, symbol, and image. The typeface I loved the most was the one George Machunas of Flexus used all the time, but it depends on the mood at the time. I like all sorts of typefaces. You'll be surprised. Yoko Ono. And this is a piece by George Machunas that's typographic. This is a performance score for In Memoriam to Adriano Olivetti from 1962. Um, of course, by using um, um, adding machine or a typewriter, George Machunas would be working with typography and using a type of technology that had become common in office places um, and professional the professional bureaucratic sphere. So that if you were working in an office in 1962, you would have access to typographic equipment, even though you don't have access to a printing press. And you would also have access to other types of text reproduction. So you'd have access to a photocopier um, and sometimes uh, other machines. But um, it's important to mention when we're talking about new eras of technology that occur from time to time that they don't cut one another off. So typography doesn't end the scribal era, for example. Um, and one way that you can see that actually would be in an office place, so that if it's 1962, again, um, you might type out a letter, which is typographic, you might sign it with a pen, which would be scribal, and then if you photocopy that, then you get um, a, um, a, essentially like a <laughs> uh, a mimesis of that, right? Um, which is is not um, um, flexible in the way that um, a typewriter would be. Um, and when people get access to photocopiers, one of the things they do, taking advantage of that sort of photographic technology that's embedded in it, is um, that they make use of its flexibility. Photocopy hands sometimes. Very commonly, people photocopy their butts. <laughs> it's not something that you can do um, with typography. And of course, there is no specific font that George Machunas is using because he's using the fonts that are attached to specific um, machines. Uh, it does seem like he, he used Olivetti commonly. And Olivetti has a connection to a type designer named Adrian Frutiger, and so does the type in this uh, lecture. This is not Frutiger, but it is um, uh, borrows heavily from him. Douglas Copeland in Bitrot wrote, you may not be a professional typographer, but to some extent, everybody is a professional typographer these days. We all use fonts, we all talk about them, we like the fonts we like, and we don't like those we don't. Sometimes we want a fresh perspective on something we've just written, so we change our words into a new font. So what he's talking about here is um, the way in which access to uh, font, well, he's talking about access to typography, but really he's talking about access to fonts. So for example, writers have had access to typography for more than several generations, right? Because as we've just discussed, we've been talking about um, typewriters. And in fact, in the late 1800s, for example, if it was important to you, you could get hold of a relatively inexpensive novelty or toy press. The thing about digital typography um, is that instead of buying a, a typewriter, which comes with a specific embedded font that you will not even know the name of, quite likely, or maybe it would be named after the machine, when you're working with digital typesetting, you're choosing fonts as you go. And so because you have that choice, you're becoming familiar with names. So that, for example, Matthew Carter, who is a type designer who is trained in the middle of the 20th century, so during an era in which people were still working with metal type, but who founded a digital foundry in the late 20th century called Bitstream, one of the things that he pointed out that was a big change for him is that early in his career, if he said that he designed fonts, people didn't know exactly what he was talking about, and that later in his career, people would not only know what he was referring to, but also be able to participate a little bit and say, oh, I like Cooper Black, do you think that's a good font, that type of thing. So maybe it's rudimentary, like maybe it's from an amateur position, but they have some sense of what a font is. And in this case here, as I mentioned, this is from a piece called Aro Kwan Doesn't Trust Garamond and Neither Should You. 
And this is writers talking about their experiences working with type um, to shape their writing experience. So for example, maybe you put off setting your piece in Garamond because the look of the Garamond will trick you into thinking that you've written something better than you have. And these are three paragraphs that are set in the fonts that they're mentioning, all of which I think are quite commonly known. So Times New Roman, Garamond, and Carrier. And the vernacular that's attached to each one, um, it's not just the look of it. Like Garamond is a more elegantly designed font, I think, than the other two. Um, but arguably Garamond is also a more comfortable font to read in a long form text so that's partly to do with the fact that it has a very very clear shape and also a shape that um, English readers uh, will be very familiar with. Um, it also sets a little bit grayer on the page not because the ink is grayer the ink remains black but because it has um, a, just a slightly thinner lighter proportion um, than Times New Roman so that has to do with not only its the weight of the stroke but it's its actual proportion if you notice courier is like very light on the page and maybe that becomes uncomfortable to read the spacing of it also is uh, again not really designed for long form text but there is always an argument that for example if you grow up only reading courier then maybe you'd feel more comfortable reading um, a novel in courier. So type originates as mechanized language and although we're no longer in the mechanical era the process of mechanization is really important to its development. Um, so we can trace the trajectory from early type to the present through three um, uh, trajectories. One is abstraction, one is speed, and one is accessibility. We start with abstraction Abstraction has to do with the, uh, the way in which type evolved away from an imitation, a mimetic imitation of the human hand, whether scribal or carving, um, and became something that was um, planned in advance and then executed. So the type on the bottom here, which is like an 18th century type, um, does, does not have the qualities of handwriting anymore. It's divorced from the human hand. And of course, with um, Gutenberg, um, what Gute Gutenberg invented was the adjustable type mode um, that is very modular and efficient um, and is designed in such a way that it's ha very heavily gridded. So to some degree, all mechanical type is heavily gridded. But anyway, anyway, it's very heavily gridded. Um, and it's also designed to be quite efficient so that there are multiple glyphs and abbreviations and so on not only to make the typesetting faster, for example, if you um, have a single glyph for a commonly used word like and, that's going to save you time, right? But the other thing is um, uh, sort of sometimes solving problems of the way that two uh, like oddly shaped letters don't fit together. So he might do something to accommodate for that. Um, and, uh, and also just to note here that, the, that the, the font that he's making is a direct imitation of, of something that's produced by hand, so it looks like writing. Um, oh, the other thing here is that the technology is adopted from other commercial industries. It's um, got, he's sort of borrowing from the wine press, he's borrowing from um, engraving, gold, goldsmiths get involved with um, type pretty early on and so on. And so this connection to commerce and the fact that type is propelled in Europe uh, largely commercially, um, even though there is some oversight from the state, it's commercially propelled, I think is part of what is the story about Gutenberg's um, uh, involvement or development of, of, of printing so that there is a conversation I've noticed that's popping up more and more, which has to do with who designed movable type first. And of course, in, in a previous talk, I've already spoken about um, Bisheng and the, also the development of Hangul in Korea. Uh, I per personally prefer to pull it out of a framework of who invented it first because it manifests so differently in different places and is structured and develops technologically very different in different places so that um, if I think, for example, let me say it like this, if I think if you frame movable type um, as so important that you're focused on 
who invented it first. I think ironically, it elevates movable type to a higher position in the history of print or more important centralized position in the history of print that it otherwise would have. So for example, if I was to focus on what a key Chinese contribution to print would be, I would say that paper is foundational. You don't have any print without paper, really. And the way in which paper develops differently in Europe and in China once it's been introduced is also a, a whole other important story. Um, so I, I hope that makes sense. That that's the framework that I would that I would think about it, and also the fact that China produces xylography. Those are such significant. Not only are those such significant contributions, but also Bisheng is just not a doesn't occupy the same cultural position in China that Gutenberg uh, occupies in Europe. And so again, it seems to me a, a strange way of actually centering uh, European print culture in the discussion. Even though I even though I understand it's not intended to do that, I think <laughs> I think it's worth um, being careful about that. Okay, so anyway, so adjustable type mold, heavily gridded, very efficient, um, intersects with the language in a specific way, um, uh, and I can't remember if I already said this, but commercially driven. Um, so here, for example, is a is a page we looked at this um, in a previous lecture. This is the Biblia Latina and Incunab Incunabulum. Um, from Fustin Schaefer, from Fustin Schaefer, who took over Gutenberg's press, um, and so just to to reiterate here, this looks very much like a representation of the human hand, and so it's kind of like the print, the mechanisms are are trying to hide themselves because this is what people are used to seeing, and so if you look, for example, at this um, very early seventeenth century um, printed book here um, from Kyoto, um, th which is also printed with movable type, you can see that the logic underneath it is actually very similar. And I think that's important so that if you look at that writing on the left there, which again is movable type, um, that it looks like handwriting. And so a, a person would be you know, unclear that they were looking at a representation quite likely, and that the way that the layout of the book is structured, the type is all gridded out on one page and the image is gridded out on the other. And if you go back, you can see, again, a very similar logic. So there's two things that are that are functioning along the same line. The third thing is that the um, shogun that was um, uh, running Japan at that time uh, who's on the right here, Tokugawa Ieyasu, who founded the Tokugawa era. Um, he, uh, his nickname is Typographic Man because he saw a potential in typography and in printing, and he was interested in preserving and disseminated um, important texts, and so he invested in it, um, partially by... Well, I won't get into it. I'll talk about it another time. But he invested in it, got involved with it. Um, but Japan, uh, as in the case of uh, in France, the um, press was largely commercial. And so it, it just did not take off. And there are, there are, again, a variety of reasons why that might be, and it's worth thinking about them. Historians, I have heard arguments about these. So I'm, just, I'm not going to make a strict argument myself. I'm just going to present three factors that I would say are worth considering. One is the structure of the language itself and how people who speak that language or read that language want to use it. One has to do with whether or not the printing press is primarily propelled by commerce or by the state. Um, and the third, what is the third one? Oh, the third um, has to do with Oh, I think it's maybe just two. <laughs> it's those two things. Um, everything else, I think, adapts to those things. Um, and so, for example, Korea um, develops movable type, has already developed movable type at this point, the first metal movable type. Um, but it's largely state controlled. It's not commercially propelled in the same way. Um, and... Um, and so, it, so it goes along a different trajectory there. Anyway, so here we have on the right um, Ieyasu, um, and you'll notice this is a uh, a woodblock, or sorry, a woodblock printing of him from the nineteenth century in a kiyoi. Um And so you can see actually what happened is that the uh, print culture, the publishing culture, developed differently, so that there was a much more of a focus on image and. Um, 
uh, printing techniques that would be um, decorative and make the book more of an object so some, and textural so that um, the role of paper and the texture of paper plays an important role. Um, the, um, sometimes there would be something like mica pressed into the surface of the paper to make it sparkle in different lights. Um, there was sometimes use of flaps and things like that. Um, and you can see that the um, writing wraps itself around the shape the shape in a way that's not grid like so it is not it doesn't need to remain um, within such a grid like structure very early on okay so we've talked about the commercially propelled publishing industry and we're back in France <laughs> and you can see a late stage um, you know aspect of commercial printing which is the magazine and also the brand so if you're looking at um, this early cover from 1926 uh, there is not such a sophisticated understanding of brand as a recognizable property as an as property that you invest in so that a consumer sees it and connects with it and says oh that's vogue and all of the properties that come with vogue and then buy it in 2000 and the 2013 cover that's here sorry but i keep doing that the 2013 uh cover that's there has a really sophisticated um brand in place that's very highly recognizable which means that it's quite valuable and it's also um, um modular and that you can swap out the name of the local um country where it's being printed in the middle of that o there so that it's again like a global brand um, the type itself, however, is that very traditional Enlightenment era type um, from the 18th century that we looked at earlier uh, within these slides. Um, and that itself comes from, it connects itself with other French cultural t traditions of um, aesthetic production. Um, and to some degree, a sort of complicated relationship with modernity. Um, which does not entirely throw aside traditional um, models of um, sort of artisanal production. So for example, France held on to a scribal culture, like a professional, sorry, I should say a professional scribal culture for a long time, um, uh, even though it, it invested heavily in type. And so as I said, you don't get this perfect interruption where the culture adopts to movable type and then abandons uh, their scribal traditions. And part of that has to do with um, things like organized labor and things like that. So you have like scribes who will put pressure on the government to make sure that they can continue to have some access to their, um, to their work, you know, like sometimes I can't remember all the ins and outs, but putting pressure on things like paper trade and stuff like that um, so that they can continue to work and then um, also beginning to find ways in which they can work with um, movable type so that in a situation like this this is actually a wood block but you would get situations in which a professional scribe would um, you know decorate uh, parts of a printed book and so on like that so again you see that intersection taking place one more thing about a brand is that the way that a brand functions, you're not reading Vogue and then thinking, Vogue, what does Vogue mean? Well, fashion or whatever. But you think of Vogue and all the brand properties that are invested in that um, um, set of letters combined together, the, the font and the customization of the font and all those things contain information above and beyond the word itself so that it almost becomes a symbol. So there are three kinds of letters or glyphs. They are written, drawn, or lettered, and typographic. So written looks like this. Here's some very beautiful writing from a young man who's 13. In the middle, these are sketches um, of letter forms that will then be executed in another material like metal or digitally or so on. So that's planned. That's the most designed in, in some respects. And typographic has to do with um, uh, letters that are pre-made whether they were designed or carved or however they were originally created, they're pre-made and then they can be regulated by machine or digital um, manipulation. And this is some calligraphy by Chris Holmes, um, which is incredibly beautiful. Uh, and you can see here, she's attached to the scribal tradition. She's trained in 
of calligraphy. And then part of her training that she applies, or sort of part of what she does is applies that training to um, early digital type. So this is a relatively early digital typeface with that G that she created with Charles Bigelow. Okay, so I'm going to talk for a second about the authority of the written word. We've kind of touched on it a little bit with brand because a brand brings with it a certain level of authority in its trustworthiness. Um, and in fact, if a brand is disrupted, like um, I guess about 10 years ago, Volkswagen was caught lying about emissions. I can't remember exactly what they did, but there was a dishonesty and that disrupted their brand integrity. Um, and so their brand was lessened in value. And similarly, if you have something like the GE logo, you can probably actually call that up in your mind, the GE logo. That's worth a lot of money. If you put that logo on something, it's worth a lot. And if GE is found to be, um, I don't know, making explodable light bulbs or something, then um, that value of that brand will decrease, right? The symbol of that. So here is a sort of early example of authority. This is Poetica Chancery script, which is a digital version of uh, Chancery with legal properties attached to it so that you would um, draw something up with the, the aid of somebody who is uh, able to produce Chancery script for legal purposes. And this was redone by Robert Slimbuck, who is a very well-known digital typographer in 1992. And one of the things that it, it this digital typeface does is it has lots of what are called alternates. So what you're looking at here, the TH is what's called a discretionary ligature, where those two um, uh, letters are combined together in a way that's decorative, so they are a single glyph. And this Y also is an alternate um, y. There are multiple Ys that go in different directions. The font has all kinds of alternates, different Ts, different As, and so on. And it allows you to recombine it in such a way that you can successfully or more or less successfully imitate the fluid quality of, of broken script lettering. In other words, lettering that's produced by hand, but where the letter forms are, are sometimes separate from one another. This is a quote from Harold Innes from The Bias of Communication, which is a mid-century book on um, communication. A complex system of writing becomes the possession of a special class and tends to support aristocracies. A simple, flexible system of writing admits of adaptation to the vernacular, but slowness of adaptation facilitates monopolies of knowledge and hierarchies. This is, a, this is an idea that I'm going to be looking at a little bit over the next couple of weeks because I think there are some interesting implications here. So the idea, like a, the alphabet is a simple, flexible system of writing. Um, and so the funny thing is in theory, if you have something that is very easily spreads, uh, or sorry, it's very easy to learn, like a, a phonic system with a limited set of characters, um, you assume that information will spread in a particular way. And similarly, if you have a way of producing text reproduction that is very accessible um, uh, so that you have a spread of knowledge, let's say that you make a book and you do hundreds of copies of that book and put it out, you're going to assume that you're going to be able to spread that knowledge um, evenly. I think, to some degree. And maybe a better example even would be a medium like Twitter, where there are a lot of journalists and writers and politicians and so on who are active on Twitter. And anybody can get an account um, and anybody can write out in it. Now, there are, um, as I mentioned before, blocks to a lot of different dialects if they're not written in Roman orthography or a handful of orthographies that are supported by the platform. Um, but nevertheless, you got my point, right? Like it, it's, it, I could go on there and so could a very famous person and we could both tweet our little hearts out. Um, but of course, information does not flow through existing social channels evenly. So if I start off an account, um, uh, I'm in a very different position than someone who is uh, already famous, maybe an actor who already has a brand uh attached to them and so maybe within a day they would have like a million followers and maybe I would have two followers. <laughs> so there are a lot of different um, factors that might prevent information from spreading evenly and so 
Um, one of the things that I'm interested in looking at when I look at social media is how knowledge pools. And uh, just as a, an attachment to that, how people fail to exchange information on that medium, which suggests to me that that medium, uh, I'm thinking here specifically of Twitter, um, just because of its, its, the role that it plays in the press at the moment. Um, it suggests to me that either Twitter is poorly designed to facilitate the exchange of information or that it is actually not designed to facilitate the exchange of information at all. Okay. So one of the things that Harold Ennis is talking about in that quote, so I'm going to go back here for a second, a complex system of writing becomes the possession of a special class and tends to support aristocracy. So here's a cuneiform tablet from Mesopotamia. This is thousands and thousands of years ago. And so the thing about this particular um, way of um, recording information is that uh, the clay would dry, dry quite quickly. Um, so not only would you need to know the marks to make, but you'd need to work very quickly and be skilled in order to do it. Um, otherwise, you are wasting material and, and unable to perform it well. And so because it requires this level of skill, um, it's quite restricted. The number of people that are able to read and write in Mesopotamia um, is, is more limited. This is a Roman du Roi that we've looked at before, and in fact, you'll recognize it as <clears throat> being an antecedent to the font used in the Vogue. Um, and the significance of it, the reason why it's come up several times is just because of its relationship with um, technology that it's uh, planned. So there's this period of time in the 18th century where type becomes abstracted from handwriting and becomes much more modular and machine-like. And part of, part of that development is an aesthetic reflection of the ideal of objectivity and also to some degree the ideal of institution um, that, that over time <laughs> begins to replace the, uh, the, the monarchy, the idea of absolute power. And so if you look on the left here, this is something that's produced for the king and you can see this very decorative um, uh, border around it, which has is, is got more qualities of, of the king, of the look of the king, of the look of the monarchy. And then inside of that um, letter forms that are becoming um, more modern. Um, and to some degree, I think you could argue herald the end of, of his dynasty um this is this is you know like about 100 years before that's going to happen and on the right you see um something that it doesn't look really i guess too important but it but it is which is that each one of the letter forms is a reference to the other letter forms in terms of their proportion and their structure um as opposed to um trying to look like independent recreations of handwritten hand expressed letters so that they become M like part of modular to a set um, and so what you see on the right there with the Q, R and the F and the S um, is a uh, they're sloping instead of turning into italics this is something I talk about in another lecture um, but at any rate they become oblique they just tilt to the side as opposed to turning into another set of characters that are are true italics and so again that speaks to a more modular way of thinking and i think it's impossible to separate out the expression um the expression of the type here and the t and the, the the kind of content and the kind of writing and thinking that was occurring at this period of time Again, you get um, very unclean, not unclean, dirty, but just not clean breaks um, in between parts of typography because here I would say you can see the triumph of the modern institution over the monarchy. The monarchy has disappeared and you have this very um, beautifully exp expressed um, symbol of institutional modernity, which is the tricolor flag and the type is extremely realized modern type it doesn't look like a human hand at all it's very clean um but the entire thing is is uh, as far as i know lithographed i believe that this lettering is done by hand and then reproduced so that it is a handwritten copy i could be wrong on this but this is what i my understanding is this is a hand rendered copy of typographically expressed type so that you have 
handwriting which inspires type and then type here which is the model for the handwriting so we mimic we mimic things back and forth okay second uh, thing that we were gonna look at is speed and so this is the bit where I realized that I shouldn't ramble so that we can get through this really relatively quickly so this is um, a little experiment that a marketing firm did to test people's um, relationship with existing brands and so I find this study very funny by the way so what you're seeing here um, are is the actual logo in the upper right hand corner and then people's um, rendered remembrances of what that logo is um, this one at the top from the, the female in Kentucky I love that logo <laughs> I like it more than their original um, and the one in the middle the target I think is a really interesting version because it looks frightening like it looks like a frightening place to go into it doesn't look friendly um, but that is her recollection of what target is and so here you see on the left all these different targets that people remember and on the right all these different Starbucks now for me, first of all, as somebody who teaches and who relays information, it is interesting to see a sort of visible um, representation of how information travels only partially consistency. So each one of these people kind of remembers what it is, but it's mapped out so differently in their head. And then, of course, many of you will have had this experience where you've got an image in your mind and you go to produce it and your pen doesn't do exactly what you wanted it to do. Um, so these are, you know, all, all hand, hand produced. Um, there's a journalist who was writing about this um, named Tom Skoka, and I liked a little comment that he made, which, which was, this thinks it is a study about how people are bad at remembering brand logos, but it is a study about how people are good at remembering brand logos and companies squander that ability. The Starbucks logo is not what Starbucks thinks the Starbucks logo is. And so this idea of what the company thinks is important and what may actually be important and the difference between those <laughs> is actually a really interesting to th thing to think about. And of course, maybe I'll just mention here that like the idea of a modern brand or a modern logo is not that old. We're at, mm, we're at about 100 years, I guess now, um, but, but there's really not that too much of a history there and so we're still I think developing some sense of of what a brand is um one thing that I find a bit odd is how how much we've adapted individually as branded people like people think in terms of branding quite often um even sometimes like weddings uh, I know when I first started off as a designer people would sometimes ask me to design sort of a, a type of brand for their weddings like why so this is symbol and rebus, and in a previous lecture, um, I had talked about um, using a rebus for I love water. This is the original I love New York. This is the this is the I love New York that Milton Glaser wrote out on a napkin. And of course, because of the time that he did this, which was a while ago, um, there was we weren't in an emoji culture, and the idea of using a heart to represent love was not common the way that it is now now this is so common and variations of this logo are so common that we take it for granted it's <clears throat> very easy to read I love New York but if you think about it if you didn't have experience with it you do have to make that um, transfer of information so I heart and why I love New York you have to do a certain amount of work to render that out um, and I do love when it's blown up you can see how uneven that uh, little heart is there. It's pre-digital. Anyway, so that's a rebus principle. So if you look at this original um, emoji set from 1999 and compare it with a more recent set, which of course has continued to undergo changes, you can see how the limitation in the technology used to limit the character set so that you have there's some cats outside, um, limit that character set and make it very abstracted. And as the technology improves, you start to be able to get things like gradient and also um, the, the consortium starts to be able to have alternate characters housed within each set. And so you can have customizable hair and skin tone. Um, sometimes there are all like um, 
uh, there was a, a period of time when there was an expansion of gender presentation um, and so on. So they're more customizable and they're more um, illustrative in a way, less abstracted. And so this move away from abstraction strikes me as a break from <clears throat> the very, you know, several hundred year trajectory towards an abstracted form, which maybe you could say hit its peak in the first half of the 20th century. If you think of a font like Helvetica, which is entirely abstracted from the human hand and has become um, also uh, arguably much more commercial, which I'll talk about a bit. Um, yeah, so this is something that I that I think is a, a significant shift, especially as we move towards ideas of subjectivity over objectivity and so on. I have to say, just maybe it is my personal taste, but I actually quite like the more limited set. I, I like that it doesn't fill up my senses as much. And I guess that's another thing I would add about these um, more developed emoji is that they are more mimetic. They, they it, make an attempt to imitate real life more, even though they're cartoon-like, um, and fill up my senses more. And I, I personally prefer a little bit of space. But nevertheless, I... I uh, well, it is what it is. <laughs> I don't know where I was going to go with that one. Okay. So mechanized language. Okay, so on the left here is somebody assembling the New York Times sports section in 1942. And you can see that it's still a fairly modular structure, but it is much more flexible than that early um, typesetting that, that we looked at in a previous slide. Um, for one thing, it, they're able to slot photography um, in there and so they would be able to mix medium media um, and maybe I'll just take this minute to say that one of the things we talk about in type or in art history or you know what have you we talk about the centering of the uh, text in the canon of um, Western art I would just point out that the the word the written word gets decentered I would say in like the 19th century um, and and part of that has to do with developments in the technology and part of it has to do with as I've said an advertising driven press and so I think it's a little bit complicated actually and, and worth bearing that in mind now on the right hand here what you see are fonts that the New York Times um, uses on Cheltenham bold italic is for headlines and the masthead here is what you might rem remember uh, as black letter and of course black letter has that very early connection with the printing press coming from a uh, sorry the the Gutenberg press coming from a German tradition uh, here you see just some sort of iterations of typesetting technology. I'm not going to get too deeply into them. There's actually a documentary about the linotype machine if you're interested. On the right is um, uh, the telegraph and so different technologies sometimes will disrupt each other um, with their mimetic speed. So if you have for example a telegraph that's able to relay information across the Atlantic then instead of having a group of reporters who cluster um, at the dock and wait for a ship to come in with news, um, all of a sudden um, they're going to be beaten by this telegraph and it created such a disruption to the American news industry um, that newspapers had to band together into the Associated Press if you see something that's like an AP release that's the Associated Press um, that they put together so that they would have a centralized place where the information would come in and then each each place would do its kind of take on it so it was to allow them to continue on um, in competition with one another um, sort of coping with this uh, change in, in technology. And these are some large presses. And again, you can see <laughs> how prominent image is becoming in relationship with text um, and that the imagery is largely advertising driven and not to be a broken record, but <laughs> the significance of commerce as, as a propeller of, of the press is very significant. The zinc plate. Uh, and its flexibility is, is an example of the type of technology that would be used to, to help make more flexible 
the, um, the printing press set up to accommodate images. And here are some telegraphers. I forgot to mention, I love the, <laughs> I love the little pack of cigarettes on the table there. Um, I forgot to mention on the bottom of that telegraph machine, you'll notice that little piece of handwriting. And again, you keep finding little bits of, of other types of text production mixed in with one another. Okay, last thing is accessibility. And of course, accessibility is still really an ongoing issue with, um, with uh, the printed word. Um, new types of um, publication production, like even just the fact that I can read your reading to you, record it so that you can listen to it, um, provide you alternate ways of getting that information other than just reading with your eyes, um, would be an example of ways in which accessibility can be accommodated by technological advancements. Um, but uh, this has to do with the spread of information again. So this is a quote from a journal, an, an editor, I guess, is a, maybe she's more of a writer and an editor, um, who wrote for an online publication called The Outline, which is now gone. It was not up for very long. What she says is, traditional newspapers are by nature conservative, not wanting to believe anything is happening until there is concrete or official proof, which marginalizes the oppressed who do not have means of providing such proof. So I think that that's a fair thing to point out um, if you're thinking about especially very large institutions like the New York Times that can feel impenetrable and um, who have a, a, you know, a huge amount of influence. And I thought I would just compare and contrast the way that these two publications look in their online format. And I will mention that each of these also had podcasts attached to them, um, and New York Times continues to, and New York Times also had a reality show connected to it, which just as an aside, uh, I'll see if I can find a clip for us to look at at some point, but I found it super odd and a bit unsettling actually to make the journalist, the story, uh, I found it a bit, a bit odd. <laughs> um, anyway, um, I don't have the opportunity to see your reaction, so I will report previous reactions and you can compare and see if, if that fits with you. Um, in general, the audiences that I've presented this to have had a strong preference for the aesthetic of the New York Times. They find it looks more approachable and believable and so on. Um, and the, the reaction to the outline is some people um, just think it looks ugly. Um, a lot of people will say they don't think it looks very trustworthy. Um, yeah, I, I've had a few people who say they think it looks cool, but I would say quite often it's it's quite negative. And so I, I'm not really intending actually to talk about which of them is good or bad. I do think objectively that the New York Times is just an extremely well-designed publication, but I know that the outline also did care quite a bit about design, so this isn't an accident. Um, so what they're each um, representing here typographically, the New York Times is connecting itself to like, the history of movable type in Europe. So the fact that they have this big black letter headline and they have um, Cheltenham, I think is a real like uh, East Coast, um, it's kind of like a tweedy font. Like if, if, if a font was gonna be wearing a tweed jacket, it would be Cheltenham. <laughs> um, and so it's saying like, you know, maybe we're a little bit stodgy, I guess, but we're trustworthy and very consistent um, over time, we're archival. Um, interesting, the New York Times had a really bad adaptation to the internet um, and uh, sold all of its archives early on for not very much money, so <laughs> they weren't quite ready for that adaptation. Um, <clears throat> the outline, by contrast here, is using essentially um, a, a, a style of type that we would associate more with commerce, actually, which is sans serif type. And so if you take a look at early European avant-garde groups like, da uh, not data, it's actually, but um, futurists or um, sort of a any group between the, the, the like distilled 20s and 30s, um, many of whom became associated one way or another with Bauhaus, um, they were using this kind of new sensor of type partly as a break with tradition, but also as a way of breaking with the kind of tradition of the book. Um, and switching, as I mentioned, more into a realm of image 
and uh, limited type or type that's designed to be seen in a different way, which is also perceived as being commercial, sort of as opposed to academic, as opposed to part of that canon, breaking with that canon. Um, and so as, I would assume that that is something that the outline is wishing to associate itself with. And certainly the use of something like clip art speaks to not only like zine culture, but also sort of early roots of, of zine culture, like Dadaist use of um, a sort of nonsense commercial clip art chopped up onto a poster or onto a page. Um, and you can see in the type of language that they use, which is really informal and sometimes even rude, that they're essentially offering that they're going to be providing a take as opposed to trying to present something objective. So these two pieces are promising something different with their typography and attaching themselves to previous traditions. So <laughs> there is a kind of weird situation that we're in right now where the internet is not brand new, but it is actually still quite new. We're not that far into it, right? And what does the internet looks like, look like? Um, it looks overwhelming, I would say. And I, I would put it to you, and this is an idea that I'm developing at the moment, that the internet is grotesque. Grotesque, not like gross, but grotesque, like formally grotesque. Okay, so this is a, a little quote from Douglas Copeland about sort of musing upon what the internet looks like. And we are in a strange place with the internet where we have a lot of technology in place so that we can do things like I can record this and upload it and you can download and listen to it. Um, that's relatively sophisticated in terms of the, the technological abilities of that. But um, at the same time, it hasn't really been around long enough for us to design for it, really. So although everything you see on the internet is to some degree sort of designed, um, it's, it's a bit patchy. It's a bit um, undeveloped and messy and uh, so there's a there's a very weird thing online which is that you have a mix of completely random images like maybe somebody will upload an image of their dog and their dog becomes a meme and then you suddenly see, see versions of the dog everywhere um, so that there's, there's that, that aspect of random production but then also there's this template look so that you see repetition of a lot of the same limited sets of fonts especially if i'm thinking of like uh no actually any orthography i'm thinking of a very limited set of, of fonts that are available um and sort of a, a template template culture that's attached to it i don't think it's at a high point <laughs> um and this looking at this here like an older these older um an older era of Max actually makes me quite nostalgic. I think it looks really cute. <laughs> um, but I, I will speak about this in a, in, a, in a future class about what the internet looks like. So maybe you can just make a couple of notes to yourself about what that might be for now. Okay, so return to the handwritten and integration of image and text. So in the same way that I mentioned that the uh, technology that you can harness to make emoji has become so sophisticated that you can start to have something that really is much more, uh, much less abstracted. You also have technology that now accommodates um, non-typographic type very comfortably for the most part, not always. Um, and so people who push back on a very modernist design aesthetic, which you would see at the top, um, sometimes, not always, but sometimes will champion something that looks much more um, hand generated. And although I completely appreciate that approach and, and sometimes agree with it, I do think it's important to recognize that it is still a commercially driven um, culture. And so if you have Nike doing something that looks uh, sorry, let me let me pull back here. If on the top here, you have a a subway a subway map that's designed to help you navigate information and it's using Helvetica and it's a, to some degree like a public service well Helvetica at this point has attained um, an expression of institutional an institutional vernacular to it um, but that's not commercial and so on the bottom if you have Nike kind of rebelling against that I would question to what degree that's a rebellion I, I think it's I think it's totally fine to run with it or enjoy it um, but I just think it's important to make sure that 
there is not a corruption of our understanding that's occurring through advertising. Um, but, but just let me explain, I guess, for a second, typographically what we're seeing here. So in the top, we see a very gridded, organized piece of information by Massimo Vignelli. This is considered kind of like a triumph of modernist design. I will say if you're struggling to navigate your way through the New York subway system, you're going to want to have it be as simple to navigate as possible. And in fact, um, I would give you an example of thinking back to March when we were getting early information about COVID and it was very stressful actually and people were confused about what was happening. At that stage, I would want information that was presented as cleanly and simply as possible. Like expression was not important to me. I just wanted to know like, where's the exit? Where's the, <laughs> where's, where's the, where's the line number two and how do I get back out? Um, so just thinking about your relationship with that type of institutional um, type would be, would be worth a second of your time. On the bottom, what you see is type. This is, um, I can't believe I'm blinking on his name. It is a very, very, very famous <laughs> avant-garde typographer from the 80s and 90s, David Carson, um, <clears throat> who um, sort of was the type of postmodern that would break all the rules of, of modern type. So you have... Um, a type that is at such a long line that it's uncomfortable to read from beginning to end. The lines are tilted in such a way that they're uncomfortable to read. Um, and they're sort of moving all over the place so that your eye always has to start at a new place, which is also disorienting. Um, and so part of what you can take from that is that this is not actually the type of text that you're supposed to read from beginning to end. It's not a paragraph from Pride and Prejudice or something. So you scan it. You scan it for information the same way that you might scan, um, uh, again, like a series of advertising or images or um, um, if you're flipping through channels or something like that. So that if you glance at this, you can just take a moment and see what words jump out to you. So for me, I get Nike, cushioning, heel, hair, face, and feet. Um, you might have different ones, but I think cushioning, the way that cushioning is, is to the right there and larger than the other type really prioritizes it so we read left to right in English that means that you tend to slow down and stop on the right hand side so it's not just kind of accidentally there it's it's making sure that although you're not going to take in all this text you're going to take away Nike cushioning I I'm assume I don't have text that proves that but that's what I know about typesetting um, and then finally just to notice that part of what this is rebelling against is rebelling against a grid structure so as we mentioned, we, as I mentioned uh, a few slides from the beginning, that Gutenberg um, linear gridded press actually couldn't accommodate this. This would be incredibly difficult to typeset on it. So whereas this connects itself to that tradition and is a, a sort of like ideal, like an idealized rational um, expression of the machine that produced it in the first place, typography, this is a rebellion against it and it is um, accommodated by the technology that we have available to us and so i'll just say this one last time and hopefully i'm not a broken record on this i don't really want to think of any of these things in terms of good or bad i do want to examine what the, how the technology is impacting the way that we perceive the information and what the intention is behind that so this is the the last slide that i wanted to go over with you because um, we are in this funny stage where you have a, a several hundred year period when movable type is kind of on the rise um, or when xylography is on the rise, depending on, upon where you are, where um, access to um, some type of print technology is important for uh, or mechanical print technology um, is going to help you reach a larger audience. So mechanical type, for example, movable type can reach a larger audience um, just in terms of its production ability than scribal or xylographic. Um, but we are now in a completely different era in which um, that's not strictly the case. And so if you have an image here, so you have at the forefront a politician who's speaking, 
um, and we're looking at a still image of that so we can't hear what he's saying if this is a short video clip that was on social media very often it's muted right so you're gonna see it and sometimes to get around that muting you'll see text that's scrolling on the bottom of the screen <laughs> so already you can see that we've got some text coming in there and so when that happens that would be a typographic um, a typographic uh, form of, of text reproduction and then of course behind him there are all these numbers and those are also typographic Arabic numerals um, but the, he's lying to you, which is handwritten, has a completely different vernacular to it. It could potentially rival text that's scrolling on the bottom of the screen that's typographic, which would probably look more like the numerals that you're looking at. It could potentially um, challenge that kind of more institutional looking type um, if you feel that the handwriting looks more um, emotive, authentic, um, personal, um, if it catches your attention, it's able to stand out from a typographic environment in a different way. And also an image like this could be reproduced and re-imprinted on by phone millions and millions of times, depending upon what it's saying. So this is the reintroduction of the hand. And in fact, the hand could supersede or interrupt um, typography. Uh, but of course, all of this is mediated by other things. So we're looking at a photograph, and the photograph contains other information like his face, the fact that he's covering up his face, and this guy's face. <laughs> um, so you know, we we haven't we have the chance to survey for ourselves theoretically. Of course, there's a lot of um, things that can be invisibilized in that. But let's just say theoretically, we have the feeling at least that we can survey the space and make sense of what's going on. If there is an audio component, we could flick that on and listen to tone of voice and try and make a, a, a sense of that. And then I guess finally is whether or not we already have a relationship with any of these people. So if you're predisposed to be in favor of or against this particular politician, um, you might experience this whole thing differently. Um, which is fair. <laughs> um, anyway, so that would be kind of how I would um, uh, want to end this, which is just taking a look at this very unusual period of time that we're in when so many different traditions are um, operating at the same time in competition with one another. And whereas pre in previous years, a scribal tradition just simply wouldn't have the same reach, um, even though it was still in play. If you write a limited series of poems and send it to 30 of your friends because you're all in the same poetry club, um, that could be a type of gatekeeping. Maybe you don't want other people to see your poetry, or maybe it's a way of, of remaining private, or maybe it's because you don't have access to a printing press, so you, the best shot you have is to get it out to 30 people. Um, it's going to depend if the 30 people you know are in a position of power or not. All these things come into play. But the point is, no matter what, you're not going to be able to compete with a printing press to get your poem out. Nowadays, you could handwrite out a poem, you could take a picture of it and put it on Instagram and beat out uh, typographic text to a degree. But then, of course, um, as we're exchanging information, whether it's on Moodle or wherever, we're producing tons and tons of typographically generated text. So it's really, all systems are... <laughs> all systems are go um, and so we have um, a, a relatively chaotic I think information environment that we are um, I think trying to cope with so that is how to talk about type special edition for 303 um, I will be uh, uploading the slides of this independently um, and I I I uh, hope that you've enjoyed it. Okay, bye-bye.